Shumai, welcome back to my wild Welsh garden. Well, that's what it was like this morning. One minute, absolutely throwing down great buckets of hail, and the next minute, the sun was shining. Um, the sun is shining at the moment, and I'm in my summer house. I've got layers of uh, jumpers on today, trying to look a little bit more cheerful. And like I say, the sun is shining at the moment, but there's some ominous black clouds uh, down there. It, it's easy to know what the weather's going to do here because it, it just comes up the valley. Um, so all I have to do is, is look down the valley and see what's on its way. And yeah, I think another, another rain or hail shower is on its way. Okay, so in the last video, I sort of talked a bit about the um, philosophy and the principles underpinning what I'm doing here, wilding my garden. And But I do appreciate that if you're just starting out on something, uh, you need something a bit more concrete, really, than uh, principles and concepts and things. So I thought in this video I would talk a bit about the different sorts of things that uh, I've done in this garden. Okay, so the first thing that I think has impacted on the amount of wildlife that I get in this garden is to go chemical free. Um, and I think it, that's so, so obvious, and well, it's so obvious to me anyway, uh, that I've never mentioned it before. But I thought if I was going to do this video, then I really needed um, to say that first, kind of get it out of the way, really. Because um, I went into my uh, local garden centre a couple of days ago, and you know the, the number of chemicals that are on sale just shows that an awful lot of people are still using an awful lot of chemicals. Okay, so the next thing that impacted in this garden, and again, it seems so obvious, is uh, feeding the animals. I mean, first of all, feeding the birds, because they're the most obvious wildlife. When, when we first came, uh, this garden was just a wasteland, and there were no birds at all. So one of the first things that we did was to put some food out. I think it was just on, a, on an old paving slab on an upturned bucket in the middle of a lawn. Um, and we actually had bets on which species would find it first. And I did think that it would be a, a sparrow or a starling or, or something like a pigeon or, or even a crow up here. But it was actually a robin that found the food first. And then since then, I've gone on to feed my hedgehog and, um, and, and the fox. I, I, I draw the line at putting meat out for the fox, but he does like apples, so I do put apples out for him. And of course, um, invaluable in all this was buying the trail cam, so I can see what's happening when I'm not here. And the next thing that I think impacted on the amount of wildlife in this garden was when I started to plant the trees, because I immediately saw more birds because they had somewhere to perch. It's March, there you go, um, it's March, just the end of March here, so the trees are still very bare. And as far as a bird is concerned, I don't think they're bothered whether a tree is native or non-native, it's just going to perch in it. But if you want to feed the birds and the insects, then flowering trees and trees that produce fruit, of course, will support a lot more wildlife. But of course, trees take a while to grow, and I wanted some immediate height in this garden so I put the arches and the trellises up and grew climbers and as far as the birds are concerned this is just as good as a tree really or a shrub they they go to the bird feeders and then they come and hide in this honeysuckle the thicker and more untidy your climbers are the better and the same with this hedge. These were tiny little sticks of things when I put them in, but they've grown up and the birds make a lot of use of them, hiding and perching and feeding on the insects and the fruit. And in this garden, I have native trees and I have non-native trees and I have cultivars of native trees. Um, so it's a mixture really. But the idea behind having native trees is that their leaves will provide food for our native insects, for the caterpillars and the grubs, which, which in turn, of course, provide food for the birds. So the next thing on my list is choosing plants which are suitable for wildlife. Now, I've always tried to 
choose plants with flowers that produce pollen and nectar. But when I started uh, on this wilding journey, I started thinking more about the larval forms of the insects, what, what I call the pretties, you know, the bees and the butterflies and the hoverflies. And I was thinking that they need native plants because if they feed on plants, they're more likely to feed the caterpillars and the grubs. They're more likely to feed on native plants than they are on non-native plants. So that's the plan for this year is to grow more native plants and alongside that is me trying to increase my tolerance for weeds and the reasoning behind that is that weeds are just native plants and so are more likely to be the food plant of the larval forms of these insects that I want to see in my garden. And there is a debate about um, native versus non-native plants uh, in a garden as to, you know, what, what it's best to have, um, particularly in, if you're going to call it a wildlife garden, you know, are you allowed to have um, non-native plants in a wildlife garden? So last year I took part in the UK Pollinator Monitoring Scheme Fit Count, which is the flower insect time count. And this is where you spend 10 minutes uh, watching a flower or um, a group of flowers of the same species and counting the number of pollinators that visit it within a, that 10 minute time period. Um, I didn't start this until June, so I don't know what would have happened with the spring flowers, but I can say that the absolute hands down winner of the summer flowers was the um, bramble. I also have to say it wasn't in my garden, it's in what I call my over the road, which is over the road. Um, but yeah, so bramble, a native flower, um, although not necessarily a flower that everybody would want to have in their garden and that I, I actually want to have in my garden, if I'm completely honest. But the other um, flowers that were popular with the pollinators in the summer, I've, I've had to write this down, otherwise I shall forget. Um, Lavender was next, which is non-native, of course, and then geranium roseanne, which is a cultivar of a native plant, um, and then wild marjoram, which is native, uh, verbena bonariensis, which is non-native, uh, and then ragwort and knapweed, which are both native. And then the autumn, the absolute hands-down winner was ivy. Uh, which is a native um, plant, but not many people would consider it to be a flower. And then the other one, lagging quite a while behind, actually, was the buddleia, which is non-native. So, interesting. Where do you stand on the native-non-native debate? Uh, I think I sort of hover around in the middle, really. I, I'm going to have some native flowers and some non-native flowers. So the, the next thing on my list, and I think we've got to number five now, is not being too tidy in the garden. And to be honest, this is the one that I've struggled with the most, really. Decay is a natural part of the ecosystem. It's a natural process that goes on in the environment. And I've been trying to leave the foliage from the plants to die naturally, and not immediately to tidy them up and hoik them off into the compost heap. And there's two ways of doing this. One is what's widely known as chop and drop, where you chop things off and just drop them on the floor. And the other is a, a variation of that, which I call chop and chuck, which is where you chop things off and then you chuck them under a bush or, or against the wall behind other plants. And then it's kind of out of sight. Dead wood is a really important part of the natural ecosystem, but there's so little of it left around these days. So I've included dead wood uh, in a couple of different ways in my garden. One is just to leave the branches on the ground and the other is to make piles. So I have untidy piles and I have tidy piles. So number six on my list is to do with the lawn. In the UK, we have what we call no mow May, where people are encouraged not to mow their lawns during May and to allow the weeds to um, flower and the, the grass to grow long. Because I think people have shown that the longer that your lawn is, the more invertebrates that it can support. 
But there is the argument, well, what's the point in allowing your lawn to grow long and flower in May if you're then going to cut it all off and deprive the pollinators of their flowers and maybe their larvae of larval food plants to feed on during the rest of the summer? So um, somebody came up with let it bloom June. But then there's the exact same argument at the end of June, because what are the insects going to do during July, August, September, October? So there's another way of managing a lawn, which is no mow summer, where you don't mow your lawn at all. Or maybe if it's big enough, you mow paths through it. So that's what I just decided I'd try and do here. Um, to begin with, I, I tried to make a, a proper lawn, a sort of, you know, short, monoculture of grass but that was just impossible here so I thought I would let it grow long but that didn't work either because uh, I need it as a social space because people come and want to sit out on it and the um, children want to play on it and that sort of thing so what I do with my my lawn here is I just cut it once a month and I'm going to create some grassy areas uh, grassy weedy areas and I'm not going to cut that at all because I've only just started to develop those areas, there's not an awful lot to see at the moment. But hopefully I shall have more to show at the end of the summer, when the grass has germinated and grown long. Here's the rain that I said was on its way. And the next thing on my list was to build a pond. This was the pond that I built first. And I have said a couple of times that I have been rather underwhelmed by the amount of wildlife it attracts and I think that's probably because most of the wildlife is actually in the water so you don't see it. There are quite a lot of larval forms of insects which come out of the water but on the whole they don't spend very long as an adult. They sort of they come out, they find a mate, they mate, lay eggs and then and then die so and blink and you, you miss them. Oh, and here comes the hail now. I've been hiding in the greenhouse, sheltering from the rain. Huh, I do a lot of that in this garden. Uh, hiding in garden structures out of the rain. And now that the sun's come out, I thought I would investigate, see what's in the pond and do a bit of pond dipping using this um, precision instrument here. So in this bowl is just one scoop of the weed and it's a little bit murky, but you can see that there are some little swimming creatures in there. I do believe that that is a dragonfly nymph. And then on the surface there is the nymph of a water boatman. And underneath is a damselfly nymph, I think. So yes, lots of, uh, lots of life. And then since the frog spawn disintegrated, I've not seen any tadpoles, but this one was swimming around in the weeds. Well, the last thing on my list, which is number eight, is access. Now, for things that can fly, there isn't much of a problem with access to a garden. They can just fly in. But for things that crawl and walk, there, there is a problem if, like me, you're surrounded by walls. So all I can say is that for five years, I had no frogs in my pond and no frog spawn. And last year, I made a hole in the breeze block wall next to the pond. And this year, I had frogs and frog spawn. So it, it might be a coincidence, but I like to think that they found the frogs found their way through the hole to my pond and that they'll do, do so again in the future. So in these last two videos, I've really tried to sort of explain and describe what I'm doing in my Wild Welsh garden. But basically, 
I'm trying to create a garden that will be good for wildlife, but will also be a nice place to spend time. It will be beautiful. So thanks for watching the video. Um, I do hope you've enjoyed it and that you would like to come again. Please like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Hoi